Hey, Eastside. Welcome to Eastside Church. Thanks for joining us. Welcome to Eastside, where we're about seeking Christ, serving the community together, teaching others, and joining in worship. Uh, just so you know, this is what we're going to do this morning. I'm going to go through some announcements. Then Rachel is going to sing, uh, lead us in singing and worship, and then I'll come back with the message, and then we'll close with some singing again. So let's begin with some announcements. First, our website, eastsideharrisonburg.org, is the place for you to stay connected and, and stay in touch with what's going on. There's updates there, there's resources there, and there's places that you can find contact information for the people that you need to find it for there. Also, you can connect with us through the app. If you search Eastside Church Harrisonburg on any of the app stores, you'll find the app store, or you'll find the app, and it's a great place for you to, to stay in touch with or, or learn information about small groups. It's a, it's a way for you to, there's a place there for you to put prayer requests, or you can uh, give right through that app. So that's another great way for you to stay connected. Maybe the most helpful uh, email address for you to know is connect at eastsideharrisonburg.org. If you don't know anything else uh, or if you don't know how to get information, if you email this email address, uh, it will get you to the information that you need. One of the things that we want to remind you is that the elders at Eastside have invited you to a radical um, show of, of solidarity together as a church family. And what we're doing, what we're asking is that everybody is going to be getting a stimulus check. And what we're asking is that you would tithe 10% of that stimulus check uh, to help meet some of the East Side family needs that we anticipate we'll be experiencing through this, through this time of COVID-19 and pan global pandemic. We'd also ask that if you're able, that you would set aside that stimulus check in your savings account, knowing that there may be further needs depending on how long this carries on. Now, obviously, if you need that money and you can't, uh, put it in savings, then we're not asking you to. But for those of us who have the ability, uh, we're asking you to set that aside. We want to use this as a time to really be church family together and take care of each other's needs. Also, uh, if you're joining us for the first time or if, you're, or if you just want to know more information about go, what's going on at Eastside, if you've never connected with us and you connect uh, with this email address, what we want to do is we want to stay connected to you. That's important to us, and we want to help you know how you can help. But we also want to help in the community that we're in. So for every new uh, contact that we get through that email, we'll give another contribution to RMH's Crisis Response Fund. Um, there's other places that we can volunteer. Patchwork Pantry, area churches in town have gathered together to support Hope Distributed. Uh, and so we'd love, if you have that ability, certainly do that as well. You can find both of those places online. Also, for those of you who live in the city, have kids in the city schools, Tuesday and Thursday nights, they're giving from 5.30 to 6.30, they're giving away meals at the schools. So you can just drive through and pick up meals there. And during this time, we're, uh, our rhythm at Eastside is changing a little bit. And so each day of the week, we have a different way for you to engage. So Mondays... Uh, Mia, our kids director, is doing something for the kids, Mondays with Mia. Tuesdays are for worship, and Rachel has been doing a great job either just blessing us with times of worship or, or different ways to interact around uh, worship. Wednesdays, we're having uh, prayer times, 714, 1214, and 714 again, three different times throughout the day. Uh, if you want to know why that's an unusual time, you'll just have to show up for prayer time. Bible studies are Thursday at noon, led by either myself or Pastor Peter. Uh, we're not spoon feeding you content. We're just uh, we're sitting down together over Scripture and and wrestling together with what it says and what it means for our lives. Fridays are for Fam Fridays, where you get to hear what's going on with different East Side families. And then obviously, you're, uh, we release a video on Sunday morning, and we have communion together at noon on Sunday, which is the last announcement. We're just going to gather together and join, and sometimes we use, some people have wine and bread, and some people have grape juice and crackers. People are using uh, goldfish uh, crackers. Whatever you have, that, that's not the point. The point is that we gather together as family, even if it's on Zoom. We gather together as church family, and we remember Christ. And we remember that together we are the body of Christ, and it's been, a, it's been an important and, and meaningful time. So with that, we're going to turn it over to Rachel, and she's going to lead us 
in some worship. Hey Eastside, happy Sunday. Hope you all had a good weekend. Um, Becca and Rachel here, residents of 264 Osh, um, but you might notice that this week, like last, uh, we we're missing Glory Ann. She had to go back to Puerto Rico a couple weeks ago, and so we miss her, but last week she texted us Sunday morning while we were worshiping with you all, and she said that she was playing cajon even from Puerto Rico. So she's with us here in spirit, um, but if you don't see her, that's why. Um, this morning, as we worship, would you stand and join us?
Oh God, thank you that you are who you are, um, that we can sing truth about who you are, Lord, in a time that is so uncertain, God, that we can proclaim truth, Lord, and that we can proclaim the promises that you've made, Lord, that you never stop working, that your promises are yes and amen, God, that you're for us. Lord, we thank you that even when we don't see it and even when we don't understand, um, you're working. Lord, we thank you that we can still gather together to worship you as a church family, even though we aren't able to gather together in person. Lord, we love you and we continue to worship you today. In your name we pray. Amen. So last week I thought that we were talking about intimacy with Jesus, um, but it was just an overview of the new sermon series. Um, so we're going to learn about intimacy with Jesus today. Um, and as I was thinking about songs and ways that we can begin to prepare our hearts for that message, um, this was one that we sang a lot a while back, um, and just the truth of it. And I think when we allow Jesus um, permission and space to do what he needs to do, um, He's going to transform it, and I think new wine will come. So as we sing this song this morning, um, yeah, just turn yourselves over to the Lord and worship. In the crushing, in the pressing, you are making new wine. In the soil I now surrender.
We're in this new sermon series called Faith for Exiles. And the, the thought behind it is this. God's people have always been invited to think of themselves as exiles. In the Old Testament, they were very literally, uh, physically removed from their home and taken to Babylon and were exiled from their home. In the New Testament, both Peter and Paul remind us to think of ourselves as foreigners, as strangers, as, as aliens, as, as people who are exiled, not in the place where they belong. Because ultimately, where we belong is with our Heavenly Father. Ultimately, our home is not here. And so we are a, to be a distinct people, a people that point others towards God, a people that remind others that this, what we're experiencing now, is temporary. We belong somewhere else. And so this series is based on a book. And it's based on a book with the same title, Faith for Exiles. And it's, it's put out by Barna, who's done over a decade's worth of research on young people. And what they've done in the past is they've looked at why people are leaving the church. But they've taken a different approach with this book, and they've, they've noticed some themes. They've noticed some commonalities. Those who are resilient disciples, those who are digging into a life of faith, those who are digging into faith in Christ, those who are digging into a life of discipleship, they have some things in common. And they looked at those five things, and those five things are intimacy with Jesus, uh, cultural discernment, multi-generational relationships, vocational discipleship, and cross-cultural mission. And we're going to talk about all of those things over the coming weeks. But today, we're going to start with intimacy with Jesus. We live in a strange, strange world. We live in a world... So in the Old Testament, the people were exiled to Babylon, and there were these cultural influences that were forced upon them. They were, they were, they were pushed down on them. We live in a world where there are all these cultural influences that are, are forced on us, are pushed down on us, are, we're encouraged to take on these cultural values. And for us, it happens digitally. Our phones, our screens, our devices have become our maps. They've become educators. They've become the primary means of interaction with people that we know and love or even that we don't. They've become the places that we shop. They've, they, you're watching me on a screen. This is as close as I'm going to get to being a movie star, and that's okay. But you're watching me on a screen. Now, we're doing that now because we have to, but that's the world that we live in, and you all are getting all of this information digitally all the time. All of us are. I took a trip in, I forget if it was late, uh, middle school, early high school, my youth group took a trip to New York City and we were talking about Times Square and we were kind of excited to see it. Times Square is this really unusual place in the world. It's a unique place in the world if you've ever been there because there are all these screens, there are all these lights, there are all these billboards advertising different things, making, making different things known to you. And if you go at night, it's really surreal because if you go at night, it's lit up like it's not nighttime. And it's almost, the way that I describe it, the way that I experienced it, it almost felt like it was, it was pressing in on you. It almost felt like it was, it was pushing down 
on you. And that's the way that all of us are experiencing life with these digital influences. You see, one of our big cultural values is to be able to express ourselves. But often that, that unique self-expression that we go for comes from an external pressure. And so we get this constant barrage of information. During, during this pandemic, uh, I've been just aware of all the information that we get. There's, there's some people think that you should treat it this way, and some people think that you should treat it this way. And should we still be on lockdown? Should we loosen lockdown restriction? What's actually helpful? What's not? And, and that's just one, like, one situation, and that's around every area of our lives. We're continually force-fed information. You'll notice on Facebook, it's called your news feed, or on Twitter, it's a Twitter feed. We're just constantly fed more and more and more. And I've gotten to the point where I'm, I'm tired of trying to sort through all the things. I'm tired of trying to pick which voice that I listen to. I'm trying to, tired of trying to figure out which one is actually being honest with me. Because to find out if something is true, I have to do a ton of research that I frankly don't want to do and don't have the time to do to know where truth is. There's only one voice, family, that we can listen to, and that's the voice of Jesus. And so that's why we're going to talk about intimacy with Jesus in Daniel chapter 1 this morning. Before we get there, I know there's lots of families and kids who are watching this together. So, kids, I want you to stop the video. I want you to turn to your parents, and I want you to ask your parents a question. I want you to ask them, why do you limit my screen time? Why do you limit my screen time? I hope that starts some good conversation, and I hope that that conversation continues. So, I asked Rachel Yoder to read Daniel chapter 1, verses 1 through 8, the other Rachel Yoder. So, you're going to see Rachel, and we're going to read through the scripture together, and then I'll be back and we'll continue. Good morning, Eastside. Today I'm going to be reading from Daniel 1, verses 1 through 8. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the articles from the temple of God. These he carried off to the temple of his God in Babylonia and put in the treasure house of his God. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, chief of his court officials, to bring in some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility, young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them the language and literature of the Babylonians. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were to be trained for three years, and after that they were to enter the king's service. Among these were some from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. The chief official gave them new names, to Daniel, the name Belteshazzar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine, and he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself this way. Would you pray with me? God, thanks so much for this day. Thank you for this time to gather through a, a digital uh, medium to look at your word and to think about what intimacy with you looks like. God, would you teach us? Would you give us the resilience to put forth the time to be a disciple of you, Jesus. We love you. We thank you. We give you praise for who you are. We ask all these things in the strong and powerful name of Christ, our Lord. Amen. One of the first things that I want to point out about this passage is uh, in verses 1 through 4, the first part of the verses, the first part of the passage. Babylon comes and besieges Jerusalem, takes takes the brightest and the best captive. It's one way to weaken your opponent, but, but I want you to pay attention to one phrase in particular. It says that they took those people without any physical defect. Now, we could just think, oh, they want people who are really capable, 
But there's something more going on here. There's, this is biblical language. And in the Old Testament, without any defect is language that's used to talk about a sacrifice. An animal that was for one purpose, either food or, or, or making an income, your livelihood, it was taken for that purpose and it was sacrificed for another purpose, the worship of God expressly in Israel's history. But here we have people who are taken and their lives have been given over. They are sacrificed for one purpose to another purpose. They were made to live for God, but now they're being made to live for Babylon's purposes. We live in a world where we're asked to give over our lives to something all of the time, whether it's a cause or whether it's a way of living or whether it's a set of values or an ideology or political interests. We're asked to give over our lives to something all the time. My family likes to watch Shark Tank. If you've watched Shark Tank for any amount of time, or if you do watch it for any amount of time, inevitably you will get to a pitch where somebody says, you know, we really see our product or we really see our company as a lifestyle brand. I had to stop and think about that phrase for a second. Lifestyle brand, what does that mean? Somebody's saying to the sharks, hey, we think that if you use our product or if you use this company, then that means that you're living a certain kind of lifestyle. This product is intended to communicate an identity about who you are. We live lives where there are constantly people trying to get us to live a certain lifestyle, whether it's uh, a brand or a company or this or that. They want us to give our lives over to something, and we begin to think, that we have some more control over identity creation than we do. One of the things that we would love for you to do in your small groups is to take time and wrestle with some of the stuff that we're talking about in this sermon series. And I want to try to give you each week some questions to wrestle with. And this is the first question that I have for you. We project an identity. We often think about the identity that we communicate in our lives. And so this is the question, what identity do I project? It'd be really good for us to take some time and to just jot down what identity we think we're projecting to the world around us. What identity is being proclaimed by how we live? I was struck last week, I was leading the words for our Zoom communion, and I knew I was preparing this message, but I was struck because in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, the words that we use for communion, the Apostle Paul wrote to the church, whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until He comes. You see, we... We live in a world where people want us by the brands that we use or the lifestyle that we have to proclaim a certain identity. And Paul said that for the church, when you eat the bread and you drink the cup, the things that you participate in, the things that you partake, the things that you, you bring into your life, those proclaim something. And Paul reminds the church that our lives are to proclaim a crucified and risen Christ. What identity do I project? So there's lives that are given over for something, and then Babylon does something uh, that happens to us too. They try to take uh, the the people of Israel, they take their cultural identity. And so they're, they're taught the language and the literature and the given the food of Babylon and trained And they're in a training program for three years. And the the goal is to erase the culture that they came from, the cultural values that they came from and being the people of God and give them completely new cultural values. It's cultural assimilation that robs them of one set of values and gives them another, right? It's, It's kingdom of God values versus cultural values. And we live in a world that is very much the same. And so here's a second question for you to wrestle with in small groups. What does our culture value? What does the culture around us value? 
And then how are those very, how are those values taught? Because the reality is that sometimes the, the things that are culture values and kingdom of God values align. But sometimes the things that the culture values are not the things that God's kingdom values. And, and we have to learn to be able to pick out what is a kingdom value and what is a cultural value and are they aligned? And when they're not aligned, what do we do? And so then asking the question, how are those values taught, helps us discern where am I being influenced and where am I being forced to take on the values of the culture versus the values of the kingdom of God. One of the ways that this plays out for us, or one of the statistics that I want to that I want to just mention quickly before we move on, is that uh, in this book, in the research, one of the things that they found is that that teenagers on opposite sides of the world. So say a say a Vietnamese teenager and American teenager, they have more in common than teenagers do with their parents or grandparents. Teenagers on opposite sides of the world have more in common than they do with their own, te- their own parents or grandparents. So the, the way that information is flowing through the world, our, our cultural values are being passed at such a rate and so widely and broadly that teenagers on opposite sides of the world have more in common than people from their own culture that they grew up in. We're, we're, we're being forced to, to look at cultural values in a very different way. The second statistic that they shared that's so eye-opening, the typical 15 to 23-year-old will spend 20 times the amount of time on screen-driven media than they will on spiritual content. What that means is that Bible reading, prayer, listening to or reading any Christian content, for every hour that you spend doing those things, you'll spend 20 hours taking in screen-driven media. That's an alarming difference. And so these cultural values are being pushed on us. We're being, we're being influenced in subtle ways all of the time. Think about all the things that are suggested for you. I'm wearing shoes right now. You can't see them. I'm wearing shoes that were suggested to me that I might like because I had searched on Facebook for shoes. Our cultural values are pushed in on us all the time. The last thing that I want to say about this is that in verses 4 and 5 of Daniel chapter 1, it says they were in this training program for three years. And it made me stop and think, you know, Jesus' disciples were with Jesus for three years. And to have intimacy with Jesus, to be a disciple of Jesus, to become a resilient disciple, it's not quick, it's not easy. When people could walk side by side with Jesus, now his spirit is still with us, but when people were physically with Jesus, he spent three years with them teaching them what they need to know. This is not quick. It's not easy. There's no magic formula. It takes time and it takes dedication, but it takes remembering what the values of the kingdom of God are. So their people, their lives are given over. They're stripped of their cultural identity. And next, they're stripped of their personal identity. You see, these Israelites were taken to Babylon and they had Hebrew names when they were taken into exile. Daniel, El is the name for God. So Daniel means God is my judge. Hananiah, Hananiah, Yah is a shortening of Yahweh, the Lord. The Lord shows grace. Azariah, the Lord helps. Or Mishael, who is like our God. They had personal identity that reminded them of the God that they served, and Babylon stripped that identity away. And for us, there are lots of people and voices and brands and institutions and cultural ideologies that try to tell you who you are and who you should be. And if we're going to maintain the identity that we are given in Christ... If we're going to maintain the identity of the church, the family of God, then we have to remember that we get our identity from Jesus. Colossians says he's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. 
He is the head of the body, the church. Oh, he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He's the head of the body, the church. I get my identity. I was created through and for Christ. The church, Christ is the head. As a church family, our identity comes only from Jesus. We have to look there first. That doesn't mean that you can't have your own personal identity differences, characteristics. But we all have to seek out Christ for our identity. We get to verse 8, and it says this. But Daniel resolved. But Daniel resolved. I'm learning new things about myself all the time. Uh, A number of years ago, it was through the Myers-Briggs personality test. And then I took a a thing called the Strengths Finder, and I learned more things about myself. And, And then we talked about fivefold gifting and I learn about myself through that way and and now it's the Enneagram and I'm a five wing six man and I know what my wife is and I know what Pastor Peter is and I'm reading all about those so I can but I'm learning more about myself all the time what scripture reminds us is that there is one who knows us intimately in in Galatians chapter 4 Paul reminds the church But now that you know God, and he's like, wait, rather you're known by God. And in 1 Corinthians 8, he does the same thing. He goes, those who love God are known by God. You see, I can continue learning new things about myself, but there is one who knows me to to the very smallest detail. Scripture says he knows even the number of hairs on our head. There's some more to know for some of us than others. Do we believe the words of the psalmist that God knit me together in my mother's womb, that he knows me in my inmost being, that before a word is on my tongue, he knows it, he created us. That's the kind of intimacy that we have with God. And listen, there's no magic formula to this. We don't just get to download the information from God overnight and and expect it to be there in the morning. This takes time, and there is no easy... It's simple, but it's not easy. The concept is simple, but it's not easy. There's no way to get around this. We have to spend time with God because He's the one that knows me in my inmost being. He's the one that can help me navigate a world where stuff is constantly coming at me. He's the one that can help me. There is no magic formula, but Daniel resolved. He decided, I'm not going to give up being intimate with my father who knows me, who knows what I need, who knows what I'm going through, who knows exactly what is in my best interest to face today, not years from now, today. There's only a few ways that we can do this. We can worship. We can can trade lies for the truth. That's what worship does. It reminds us of who God is and the things that we're struggling with, the things that are lies, and uh, we replace lies with the truth. There's There's a bridge of a song that we sing that says, Why do I worry? Why do I worry? Why do I worry? And what worship does, one of, one of the things that it accomplishes, it, it reminds us that, that we live lives where we're affected and influenced by sin and outside pressure, but we serve a God who knows us intimately. And when we serve a God who knows everything about us, we don't need to worry. You can do it by spending time reading your Bible, studying, seeing what, what is revealed about God and what is revealed about people through reading the Bible, you can spend time in prayer where God can speak to us. It's this back and forth. Usually it's the fourth that we focus on, and it's what I want to tell God. But it, prayer is a back and forth. It's, it's an exchange of, of wishes and desires. And I'm, I'm taking my desires, and I'm laying them before God and saying, here's what I would like, but what would you like? And then we can gather with the church because we need people around us. You can see my faults better than I can see my faults. 
And sometimes I need to be made aware of my faults, but I need people who love me and who want the best for me and who are going to be gracious and kind and patient with me. And that's what the church is and should be. And look, you guys, that's never been more necessary than right now. We're forced into isolation, and that's tough, I know. And it's tough to look at people through a screen. It is so difficult to, to, to read others through a screen. But do, I know it's difficult, but don't give up. Reach out. Our guys' Bible study. I actually started, joined the Bible study, and the first time that I met with them was the Zoom meeting. And it's tough. I can't wait to hug those guys and be together with them in person again. And I can't wait to gather as a church family again. But we have to continue reaching out. Look, I, when we get together, you guys, I can't wait. I'm an introvert. That, all that means is that I want to be with you guys. I may not talk to you, but that's okay. Like, it just means, like, we, our bodies are, we are made to be with other people. And God knows us all intimately, and he wants to shape us all together into the family of Christ that lives and moves and work and works in the world in a way that makes him known. It's never been more important than right now. Just, I want to be real practical for a second. There are different acronyms to, to help you in, in your times of prayer. And there's different ones like ACTS, Adoration, Confession, Thanksgiving, Supplication. That's great. I'm not saying that there, any of them are bad. What I'm saying is this one I've found helpful, and it's actually one that we just learned in the, the book that we're going through for our guys' Bible study. And it's the acronym PRAY. Praise, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to name how good God is. I'm, name in Scripture is character and quality. I'm going to lift up God's name, which means I'm going to say how good His character and His quality are. I'm going to name God's goodness. I'm going to praise Him. And I'm going to repent. Repent just means you turn or change your mind, change direction. I'm going to notice the ways in my life that my values aren't lining up with kingdom of God values. And I'm going to turn from those or turn towards those, and turn from cultural values towards values of the kingdom of God, and that's what repentance is. It doesn't mean you're a terrible person. It means you're a disciple of Jesus to repent. That's all that it means. And then we get to ask. We get to come before God, and we get to ask anything. I get to ask. One of my favorite uh, sermon I heard a long time ago, said, the guy said, you want a yellow Corvette? Ask for a yellow Corvette. But do you know what? God has the right to say no because he's God. And that's the thing that I love about this acronym is yield. So you've prayed, you've repented, you've praised, you've repented, you've asked. Now it's yield. When you yield in traffic, it means I stop and give up my right to go and I allow somebody else to go. And it's the same way in prayer. I stop, I shut my mouth, I give up my right to name all the things that I want and I allow God to go. I allow him to speak. And for me, that looks like silence. That's, uh, I mean, I think for most of us, there should be some silence so that we can listen to God. But that's why I like this one, because there's a, a yielding that happens uh, in this structure. I need structure, and so this is helpful. Another thing that's helpful for me, about three years ago, I told you all something that I had heard that I found helpful, that I began writing out my prayers. So about, about 34 months ago, somehow I stopped that practice. And I was reminded just two weeks ago, hey, why aren't you writing out your prayers? Because my mind tends to go here and there and I don't focus. But when I'm writing, I'm, I'm forced to slow down. And God doesn't need a volume of words. What he needs is you to be intimate with him so that he can teach you about who you are and what he's like. Lastly, resiliency doesn't happen on its own. Resiliency doesn't just happen. We're talking about what it takes to be resilient disciples. Resiliency doesn't just happen. And I love this. So in Daniel chapter 6, Daniel, uh, there are some people that don't like Daniel, and they want him removed. He's given a place of prominence, a place of power, and they want him out. And so they go to the king, and they say, King, we think you should make a decree that nobody can pray to anybody but you. Everybody should just pray to you, king. And the king, being a very... Uh, a guy like myself, he thinks, you know what? That is a good idea. I think people should pray to me. And so he makes the decree. And Daniel hears the decree, and that's where we're at in, in uh, chapter 6. Now, when Daniel learned the decree, the decree that said, don't pray to anybody else. 
When Daniel heard the decree that had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened towards Jerusalem, towards the kingdom of God, towards the set of values. This is what he's facing. He's, he's looking towards, symbolically, uh, the things that God wants for me. And he's turning away from the king that he's supposed to be praying to. And three, day, three times a day, he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to God just as he had done before. You see, the things that we know about Daniel and his three friends is they practice intimacy with God. There's a decree given, don't pray. So what's the first thing that Daniel does? He prays. Family, there's going to be a lot of times when we face things in life. What's the first thing you're going to do? Because there's one who knows you better than you know yourself. There's one who knows how to help. There's one who can give you what you need. That's why intimacy with Jesus is so important. It's always been the case. We just have this book now from Barna to, to prove it scientifically that resilient disciples focus on intimacy with Jesus. Look, there's other things. We can, we can have cultural discernment uh, without a focus on Jesus. We can have intergenerational relationships without Jesus. We can focus on our vocation without Jesus. We can even give our lives over to some mission without Jesus. We have to have intimacy with Jesus that, that drives all of those other things. At Eastside, we're about seeking Christ, serving the community together, teaching others, and joining worship. We seek Christ first because it's out of intimacy with Jesus that we move into those other things in the proper way, in a way that follows after Jesus, in a way that shows that we're disciples of Jesus, that our lives proclaim Jesus. Eastside, I love you guys. I can't wait till we're together again. Take time to focus on your relationship with Jesus. We'll see you soon. Be blessed. Thank you.